Hello, and welcome to Chapter 10. How have you been? This is Professor Naragon bringing you another exciting adventure in business statistics where we start looking at the one sample test of hypothesis, which is interesting in itself where we go and learn how we define population parameters by uh, defining this hypothesis and hypothesis testing, the steps that are going to be outlined to it, and conduct the test. Maybe some errors as well. So, of course, we know how the path goes. Let's see our learning objectives for this chapter. Alright, so again, we're going to explain the process of testing a hypothesis. We're going to apply the six-step procedure for testing a hypothesis. Distinguish between a one-tail and a two-tailed test of hypothesis. Okay, conduct a test of hypothesis about a population mean. Compute and interpret a p-value. Yes, now we got P value. And Z, T, now we jump to P. We're going backwards in the alphabet here. Finally, we're going to use a T statistic to test a hypothesis. Y'all ready? Sounds like we got a lot of fun ahead for us. So, what is a hypothesis? Well, this is a statement about population parameter subject to verification. Basically, we put out an assumption. That's what it is. It's an assumption we're assuming uh, this is the case. And with that, just like if you were in science, you have to prove it kind of thing. You have to test it. Make sure, is it correct? So, examples that they give. The mean speed of automobiles passing mile post 150 on the West Virginia Turnpike is 68 miles. We'll have to test it. Uh, the mean cost of a to remodel a kitchen is 20,000. Wow, <laughs> 20 grand. But again, we would have to test it. We have to have samples to actually test these hypotheses that we have come up with. And we've done what? I mean, kind of this way. But now we're going to dive even deeper into it. So, our objective of the hypothesis testing is to verify the vid validity, validity <laughs> of a statement about a population parameter. Is it valid? See, I can say valid, but I can't say validity. <laughs> so it is a procedure based on sample evidence and prob uh, probability theory to determine whether the hypothesis is a reasonable statement. It's really what we're trying to do. So step one, we want to state the null and alternative, all alternate hypotheses. Sisses. <laughs> Select a level of significance. Step three, we're going to identify the test statistic. Step four, formulate a decision rule. Step five, take our sample and arrive at a decision. And then step six, we're going to interpret the result. Now again, we've kind of already done five and six before in uh, a few other chapters. Here is the main bulk. What are we doing? Why we do it? So starting off with step one of the six step process. We will have the null hypothesis. Or what we've seen as H with the subscript of zero. And the alternate hypothesis. H with the subscript of one. So the null hypothesis is a statement about the value of a Population parameter developed for a purpose of testing numerical evidence. It is a statement that is not rejected unless 
our sample data provides convincing evidence that it is false. Failing to reject this null hypothesis does not prove that H uh, subscript 0 is true. It means we have failed to disprove our null hypothesis. Our alternative hypothesis is what you will conclude if you reject a null. Return to the alternative hypothesis only if the data suggests the null hypothesis is untrue. So, basically, when we look at the alternate hypothesis, it is a statement that is accepted if the sample data proves sufficient evidence that the null is false. So, and they do give us examples. With our null hypothesis, it always includes the equal sign. So, for example, we have equal. We have greater than or equal or less than an equal will be used for H subscript 0 or null hypothesis. The, uh, uh, the alternate hypothesis never includes the equal sign. Okay, that's how we can really tell the difference between the two. Again, null will always have it. Alternate will not. Step two of the process. Next, we select this level of significance. This is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is true. This is sometimes called the level of risk. How much risk would we want? Can be any value between 0 and 1. Traditionally, we either use 0 0.05 for consumer research projects, 0 0.01 for quality assurance, and 0 0.1 for political polling. There's the political stuff again, just like last chapter. Uh, there is not one level of significance that is applied to all tests. The researcher must decide on the level of significance before formulating the decision rule or collecting the sample. It is a risk you take of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is really true. And usually we will designate this with the Greek letter alpha. So, step two, we figure out the level of significance, okay? So, possible errors in hypothesis testing. Since the researcher cannot study every item of individual or individual in the population, error is possible. We have two types. Type one, we're going to reject the null hypothesis when it's true. Or... Type 2 error, not rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false. And of course, type 1 will be designated with alpha, and type 2 will be designated with beta. And I like that they have the little graphic right here. That actually shows you correct decisions and the errors that are involved. Next, step three, and don't worry, we'll, we'll, we'll go through all, all the steps when we get into the uh, more of the calculations. So, step three of the process, we're going to select the test statistic. Now, the test, the, the, uh, <laughs> the test statistic is a value determined from sample information used to determine whether to reject the null. In hypothesis testing, for the mean, again, that's represented by mu, when standard deviation is known, the test statistic Z is computed with the following uh, formula. Yeah. So, again, when standard deviation is known, 
basically the population deviation, population standard deviation. We have z equals our x bar minus mu divided by that standard deviation divided by the square root of the number in the sample. Looks like a fun formula. It really does. A lot of parentheses that are going to be used. But using the z value, we can determine probabilities that a sample mean is within a specified number of standard errors of the population mean. Okay, so what? What, what are we talking about? So the v, z value is going to be used to determine the central limit theorem. Um, basically, it's going to say that the sample distribution of the sample mean is normally distributed. Again, we're going to use that symmetric bell curve. That's why we got the z value. Okay. So, using the z value, basically is going to give us that range like we did in chapter 9. Okay? And we can actually state, does it fit this area? Now, again, we can have sampling errors, but we're going to try our best to do as the best as possible. So, step 4. We're going to formulate the decision rule. The decision rule is a statement of specific uh, conditions under which the null hypothesis is rejected and the conditions under which it is not rejected. Okay. The region or area of rejection defines the location of all the values that are either so large or so small that the probability of occurrence under a true null hypothesis is remote. And we're going to have something known as the critical value. This is the dividing point between the region where the null hypothesis is rejected and the region where it is not rejected. Yes, right there. So, where do we want our hypothesis to go? That's the key. But what is this critical value? Okay, Critical value in itself. It is the sampling distribution of the statistic Z follows the normal distribution. Here, an alpha, so remember alpha is the, the type 1 error of 0 0.05 is used in a one-tail test. Now, since we're dealing with the normal distribution, we're looking at one tail, we're only looking at one side. Two tail is both sides. So we're really looking at this pro region of rejection. Okay. So the value 1.645 separates the regions where the null hypothesis is rejected and where it is not rejected. The value is the critical value. So again, basically where the limit is. Because as soon as it goes past this, the 1.645, it is in rejection mode. Again, probability is 0 0.05, 5%. All right. And then they just decide to put one slide for 5 and 6. It's all good. So step 5, we're going to make a decision. We're going to compute the value of the test statistic, compare the value of the test statistic uh, to the critical value, then make the decision to reject or not to reject. Then we're going to interpret the results. What can we say or report based on the re results of the statistical test? So, again, the results of the test result in the decision not to reject the null. We can say that it's based on the sample data. The difference between the sample mean and the hypothesized population mean was not large enough to reject the null. On the other hand, if the results of the test result in the decision to reject the null, 
you have disproved the null hypothesis with a stated probability of a type 1 error in alpha in itself. So there is a small probability that the decision to reject the null was an error due to random sampling. Alright. Summary. Yes. The summary of our testing. Wow. Again, first thing that we have to do is establish the null and the alternative hypothesis. Step two, select the level of significance. Okay. Step three, select an appropriate test statistic. Step four, formulate a decision rule based on steps one, two, and three. Step five, make a decision regarding the null hypothesis based on the sample information. And set step six, interpret the results of the test. Okay, so lots of fun stuff. So when we look at one tail and two tail, again, um, one way to determine the location of the rejection error region is to look at the direction, the inequality sign in the alternative hypothesis is pointing. A test is one tail when the alternative hypothesis states a direction either less than, which is left tail, or greater than, which is our right tail. In the case of not equal to, the mean could be either greater than or less than. So that's a two tail test. And a two-tail test divide equally into the two tails of the sampling distribution. Here, with alpha as 0 0.05, well, since it's a two-tail, we're going to divide that by two to give us 0 0.025 in each tail. So you know it changes just a little bit what the two-tail. But... Again, look at the symbols. Greater than or less than in our alternative. Here we have not equal. Not equal is always going to be a two tail. Example when standard deviation is known. So, Jamestown Steel Company manufactures and assembles desks and other office equipment at several plants in New York State. At the Fredona plant, the weekly production of the model A325 desk follows a normal distribution with a mean of 200 and a standard deviation of 16 desks. New production methods have been introduced and the vice president of manufacturing would like to investigate whether there have been changes in weekly production of the model A325. Is the mean number of deaths produced different from 200 at the 0 0.01 significant level? Now, what we want to know is if the normal distribution does equal to 200, not greater than or less than. And our alternative is, is it different from 200? Given that, we can state a null and alternative hypothesis where we assume for our null uh, to be true, mu has to equal 200 desk. While the alternative is, is there a difference from 200? So we're going to say not equal. As soon as we say not equal, it's a two-tail test. Again, step two is then we're going to go um, by selecting the level of significance. Here, alpha equals 0 0.01. That is part of our problem. And in step three, we're going to select the test statistic in this example. Again, since standard deviation is known, we're going to use Z. If we did not know what the standard deviation of population was, then we're going to use a T, a T value. Okay. 
So again, they show the formula right down here at the bottom. And we're going to actually start putting this together. So here we go. Two-tailed test still. So step four. We're going to formulate the decision rule by determining the critical value of Z. Okay. So, since we got a two-tail, 0 0.01 divided by 2 equals to 0 0.005. There it is, there it is. So, the remaining, where we do not reject, on each side is 0 0.4950, our total of uh, 99%. Okay. So, we're pretty much got a good test going on here. It is going to be very difficult uh, to reject. Alright, so our decision rule is if the computed value of Z is not between negative 2.576 and 2.576, again that range, uh, reject the null hypothesis. If Z falls between these two, do not reject the null. Simple as that. So step five, we want to take sample from the population, compute the test statistic, and make our decision. So the mean number of deaths produced last year, 50 weeks produced, uh, because the plant was shut down two weeks for vacation, is 203.5. The standard deviation of the population is 16 deaths per week. We're going to compute Z value. Okay. So X bar minus mu divided by standard deviation divided by the number of our sample's square root. So this ends up being 203.5 minus 200 divided by 16 divided by square root of 50, which comes out to 1.547. Okay, so our decision is this. Since it does not fall outside our range, it falls right in. So 1.547 falls in our um, do not reject region. We decide not to reject the null. So then we're going to interpret the results. We do not reject the null hypothesis, so we have failed to show that the population mean has changed from 200 per week. Okay, now the sample information fails to indicate that the new production method resulted in a change in the 200 deaths per week production rate. However, we did not prove the assembly rate is still 200 per week. We failed to disprove it, which is not the same thing as proving it to be true. Okay? So we do have to watch out. We just knocked out one of the, um, one of the situations. So we've done that. Then we can get into one tail test. Which, suppose instead of wanting to know if there had been a change in the mean number of deaths assembled, the vice president wanted to know if there had been an increase in the number of units assembled. Can we conclude because of the improved production methods that the mean number of deaths assembled in the last 50 weeks was more than 200? Okay. So before, with a two-tail, we either know that it was going to be equal to 200 or not equal. Here. Our test here is that, again, we have to be equal to 200. 
So our null is going to be less than or equal to 200 desk because we want to see if now there's been an increased number. So it's got to be greater than 200. It's not going to equal to 200. So our alternative is going to be the greater. So instead of the two tail, where we had 0 0.005 on each end, it changes to now 0 0.01 on one tail. So the critical value now is 2.326. Okay. So 99.99% is still being, uh, does not reject. Okay. Now, again, we can uh, calculate as we go through. So in the two tail test, again, we split the two. And one tail test, we put all the rejection region in one tail. Using appendix B.5, um, we will be able to use that in the book to determine our critical value. So, again, we can calculate everything and move forward. Okay, But will it still be rejected? Most likely, no. Again, it will probably fall right in between the um, one point something because we already calculated at 1.547 so it still falls within the not rejected area all right next the p-value in hypothesis testing Yes, p-value again. So, the probability of observing a sample value as an extreme as or, or more extreme than the value observed, given that the null hypothesis is true. What we're going to do here is we're going to compare the p-value with the level of significance, and alpha. If the p-value is smaller than the significant level, we're going to reject our null. If the p-value is larger than the alpha, null is not rejected. So again, just another way to either prove our hypothesis or not. So p-value not only results in a decision about null, but it gives an additional insight about the strength. So interpret the weight of evidence against null. If the p-value is less than a 0.10, we have some evidence that null is not true. 0 0.05, we have a strong evidence that null is not true. 0 0.01, we have a very strong evidence that null is not true. 0 0.001, we have extremely strong evidence that null is not true. So as closer we get, I mean... the stronger our evidence becomes. It's like we're just defining it. So a p-value is um, going to indicate the likelihood that no is true, very small. Or on the other hand, a p-value, I mean, so p-value of 0 0.2033 um, means that null is not rejected. And there's a likelihood that is false. That's a little bit weird, but <laughs> but we are going to start finding out the p-value. Can we actually make a case for our null? So how do we find it? Okay. So in the previous example about the desk production, remember the two hundred. The computed Z was 1.547, okay? and null was not rejected. Round the computed Z value to two decimal places, so about 1.55. Using the Z table, 
finding the probability of finding a z value of 1.55 or more by 0.5 minus 0.4394. That's our z value. Equals to 0 0.0606. Okay. Since this is a two tail test, we're going to take two times that 0 0.0606 to equal to 0 0.1212. In this chart, we can easily compare the p value with the level of significance. So there's our 0 0.0606. On each side. Right. So, while we compute this, the probability of finding that sample mean greater than 203.5 when the population mean is 200 is that 0 0.0606. So, once we times it by 2, we find the p value of. 0.1212 is greater than the significant level of 0 0.01. So, null is not rejected. We do not reject it. All right. Now, let's go ahead and look at what would happen if we have an unknown standard deviation. Oh no. Oh no. Oh yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Uh, so, again, when we have the standard deviation unknown, this is when we have to bring in that T value. So instead of calculating Z value, we calculate T value. Remember with the degrees of freedom? So every time we see uh, N, we have to make sure with we calculate that degree of freedom that's n minus one okay the rest of the numbers still stay the, basically the same except we are going to use the sample standard deviation instead of the population one because we don't know what it is so again as re reference from chapter nine uh, the characteristics of t distributions are that they're continuous they are bell shaped just like symmetrical, except a little bit flatter. There is a family of T distributions depending on the number of degrees of freedom. And there you go, that flatter one on the last one. So, let's go ahead and do an example of an unknown standard deviation. So, in Merrill Beach International Airport, provides a cell phone parking lot where people can wait for a message to pick up arriving passengers, which is pretty awesome, to decide if the cell phone lot has enough parking places. The manager of the airport parking needs to know if the mean time in the lot is more than 15 minutes. A sample of 12 recent customers show they were in a, the lot the following lengths of time in minutes. Which really looks like a lot right there. So, at the 0 0.05 significant level, is it reasonable to conclude that the mean time in the lot is more than 15 minutes? So again, since we're seeing they're asking more than or less than, this is going to be a one tail um, item okay so our basically it gives us that alternate uh, hypothesis that the mean is greater than 15 minutes so that would mean our null will have to be less than or equal to 15 minutes and just judging by that fun numbers right there it may swing a little bit to the more. Especially when someone's waiting there for 39 minutes. Woo! Alright. So, first thing that we have to do is select the level of significance. We 
and it was stated there that we're going to use 0 0.05. Notice in the chart, we have the 0 0.05 on a one tail test. Remember, two tail is only when it's equal or not equal. One tail is always going to be more than or less than. So this is going to tell me the significant table, 0 0.05. Now we're going to try and select the test statistic since we're using the T um, test since sigma, which is standard deviation, is unknown. We need to take the number that we have, which is 12 recent com uh, customers, minus 1 to get to 11. Again, degrees of freedom. It's always our sample size, minus 1. So since it's at 11, it will tell us that the T value is going to be 1.796. Okay. So once we make our calculation, uh, we'll be able to figure out, is it really more or is it less? Does it fit in the rejection region, that one tell? All right, so let's go ahead and do it. So we're going to take the sample, um, calculate the simple mean uh, and the sample standard deviation, which again, it gives us uh, the deviation, which will be uh, 15 minutes. Oh, not 15 minutes, sorry. We actually have to calculate the the uh, standard deviation, which, again, we would have to do our little fun little Excel chart and go through all the steps of that. So we'll probably do that with the practice problem, okay? But again, we have to calculate standard deviation, remember, get the variation and square, square root, all that fun jazz for uh, standard deviation. It ends up being 9.835. Again, we'll go over that uh, through practice problems if we need to calculate. So they take 23, which is, again, our X bar. That is, all of a sudden I blanked, <laughs> our sample mean. Yeah, and then our hypothesized population mean. I don't know why all of a sudden I forgot the term. It happens. Um, so 23 minus 15 divided by uh, 9.835, which was our sample uh, standard deviation, divided by the square root of 12, which was our sample size, comes out to 2.818. Okay. Now, all of a sudden they do make an error where it says the test statistics of 8.818, which is actually 2.818, they got another, another 8 there, it is greater than our critical value of 1.796. Still credit. Therefore, our decision is do not reject. All right, so they have some errors here. We going to have to reject because uh, it does not follow but basically the interpretation of the result we conclude that the time customers spend in the lot is more than 15 minutes which counteracts um uh, Uh, counteracts uh, the, the null. I don't know why they, they say do not reject. When the null is saying that the, the mean is less than or equal to, we did conclude that it is greater, that the alternative uh, has been proven. So, yeah. Sometimes that happens in the PowerPoint. Anyway, so 
is concluding that since it is greater, it's in the rejection uh, of our null. That is more than 15 minutes. The result indicates that the airport may need to add more parking places. Okay. Now, sometimes that's odd. All right. So, practice problems. Oh, oh, practice problems. Okay. So, we're going to go through these step by step. Y'all know the drill. Pause, try to figure it out on your own, and then we're going to go through uh, each of the items. Because it seems like there is three, and there's our fun uh, stat one right there. Okay. So, a recent national survey found that high school students watch an average mean of 6.8 movies per month with a population standard deviation of 1.8. The distribution of the number of movies watched per month follows the normal distribution. Okay, A random sample of 36 college students revealed that the mean number of movies watched last month was 6.2 at the .05 significant level. Can we conclude that college students watch fewer movies a month than high school students? Okay, so since I already hear, see the fewer, we already know that we're dealing with the one tail. And since we're dealing with the one tail, and let's see if I can. Let me see. I'm going to learn something new here. Um, since we're dealing with the one tail, and we need to find out uh, to conclude that college students watch fewer movies a month than high school students. That means we're going to be using the high school data, 6.8. And... Nope. There we go. So, our null will end up being. Well, let's see, I'm going to do my best to do a <laughs> mu. So, our mean. It's going to be greater than or equal to 6.8. Well, that is a bad 8. But point. And then that means our alternative hypothesis will have to be less than 6. Point eight. Remember, the question usually gives us our alternative. Okay. So now we need to figure out z value. Well, we've already done z value before with 0 0.05 significant level. That ends up being all the way over here. be about uh, negative 1.645. Uh, find back here. All right. So basically negative 1.65. The reason why it's negative is because our alternative is less than. Our null is saying that it's going to be greater than or equal to that. So, Z value is negative 1.65. Again, so for us, it's time to do our calculation. So, gotta get our calculator out. 
And again, since we know we know the standard deviation, we know sigma, we're going to be using uh, this formula right here. Okay? So, calculator. We're going to take the 6.2 minus 6.8, which is a negative 0.6, divided by, put in parentheses, 1.8, divided by our sample size. And square root, close parentheses, and then enter. It ends up being negative 2. Okay. Now, oh yeah, now I get why they say reject. And, um, that's just. All right. Yeah, do not reject. Yeah. Anyway, so sorry, a little bit off tangent there. Uh, just trying to think of what the book was going with with that last example. But anyway, since our calculator has stated that it's negative two, and z value is negative one point six five, this is indeed lesser this is within our tail so if I drew my tail which that is a really bad bell curve and we have the negative 1.65 so this is our rejection area well negative 2 of course falls right in that so that means we're going to reject the null. The null is rejected. It doesn't compute according to these numbers. So our alternative is actually correct. So... Basically, what we can conclude is that, um, on average, college students do watch less than uh, high school students. Now, again, uh, because of the sample size, we could have a margin of error. And I think the, they went actually went to looking at p-value. Yeah, so they want to get in with the p-value test, which for us, we would have to, let's go to the z-value. So we need to go to our z table. Let's see if they have, I don't know. <laughs> just went through this so I'm trying to find the Z table on this so we would have to go to the Z table so let's go to the Z table okay so I popped up the uh, Z table for y'all I know you kind of got the little skip uh, but so for the Z table we need to find 1.65 which is right here, 0 0.4505. Then when we're looking for the p-value, again, uh, we're going to have to calculate uh, 0.5 minus our 0 0.4505 since it's definitely a one tail. So calculator. Whoop. Clear. 0.5 minus 
0 0.4505. Now we find it as 0 0.0495. Now, back to our slides. So, our test is right here. 0 0.05, we have a strong evidence that HO is not true. Okay? Here it is less than, it's not greater than. Okay? It is less than this number, so we do not have strong evidence. Now, so, it can fall. But look at now how does it get closer to these. So right here where there is some type of evidence weighted against uh, H uh, to our null with the p-value. But our sample size may be just too small. So we're going to have to really negotiate uh, how to actually interpret if we need to increase our sample size and move on. All right. Now, question 13. Okay, new one. We're going to pause. Okay. Now, the mean income per person in the United States is 60000 And the distribution of incomes follows a normal distribution. Okay. A random sample of 10 residents of Rillington, Delaware had a mean of 70,000 with a standard deviation of 10,000. Again, we know the standard deviation. At the 0 0.05 level, okay, so we also know that one for z-value, which is 1.65. Uh, level of significance is the enough evidence to conclude that residents of Rillington, Delaware have more income than the national average. All right. So we have a standard deviation. Is this the population? No. Unfortunately, it is not. Our population is the U.S. This is a sample standard deviation. Okay. So it gave us this number. Yay. Unfortunately, we don't know um, what the population standard deviation is. So we're going to have to find our t-chart and actually figure this out. Now, we knew the z-value. Z-value would have been 1.65 if it was the population standard deviation. But as we always go back through, we make sure, is it population or standard? All right. So... First one, let's create our hypothesis. So, each zero, the null, and our alternative. Right now, we want to see uh, what the keyword is. Is it going to be one tail or two tail? Well, we have, of course, more. More tells us already that it's going to be a one tail. It also, again, tells us how much we're going to be looking at. So the mean income per person in the United States is uh, 60000 So we want to know if they have more income than the national average. Here, that means mu, again, is uh, well, that was actually a great view. I'm allowed to say that is greater than 60,000. And then I follow up with really bad zeros. <laughs> okay. And our null states. That it was going to be less than or equal 
is a 60k. Okay, so there's our two. There's our significant items. Next, let's find our t value. So, charts, again, remember B3 is for Z, and then uh, B5 is going to be our T distribution, okay? Two different uh, tables. We haven't gotten to the F distribution yet, so don't look at critical value there yet. Yes, just a preview of what's to come. All right, so we know our significant level is going to be... 0 0.5 but watch out so this one says two tail we're not doing two tail we are dealing with a one tail so always be careful because there are two ones always make sure you get the right one okay so 0 0.05 so we're looking in the second column and then we have to look at what our sample size was it is 10 so it's 10, that is our sample size, but that is not our degrees of freedom. Remember why? Because we have to take the sample size and minus one. So this is our actual degree of freedom, is nine. Okay, be careful. So that means 0 0.05 for one tail, nine. This is my T value. Okay, 1.833. So we got to make sure um, if T value is greater than 1.833, then we're going to reject our null. Okay. So let's find out. Let's bring out our calculator. Go back to our table. And again, Why it gets a little slow. We're going to be using the T value, which is right here. T value. Yay. Okay. So let's figure it out. Do, 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 Again, I think the book has a little issues. Yeah. So, right here we're going to calculate. All right, so our sample mean, which is 70,000, minus the population will give us 10,000, okay? Then we have to divide it by All right, then we divide it by parentheses, our sample standard deviation, divided by, a lot of divided bys, what is our sample size, square root, and we're equal to 3.16. So, since it's 3.16, is it greater than the T value of 1.833? Yes. So, we would, again, 
we're going to reject the mu or the null because we did find out that it is, according to our hypothesis, it does follow the alternative where the mean is going to be greater than 60,000, the population mean. Okay, so we reject HO or not HO, uh, the null, and that's it. It gets a little bit. It's a little bit more practice. Practice makes perfect. Okay. So, now we have question 19, which is a Washington, D.C. think tank announces the typical teenager sent 67 text messages per day in 2017. Okay. To update the estimate, your phone has a sample of 12 teenagers and ask them how many text messages they sent the previous day. Their responses were, those numbers, at the 0.5 level, can you conclude that the mean number is greater than 67? Compute the p-value and describe what it tells you. All right, so again, we don't have um, the population. So we're going to have to find out the T value. And again, we're going to have to calculate uh, this time the sample standard deviation. So we'll have to bust out Excel again. All right. So let's first off do step one, which is, of course, dealing with our hypothesis. What will we do? Okay. So the question asks, can you conclude that the mean number is greater than 67? So again, HO, our hypothesis, uh, our alternative, our alternative is always the, what the question asks. So, They're asking, is the mean number greater than 67? Okay, so that would mean our hypothesis, our null, has to be the opposite, which is less than or equal to 67. Okay, next we're going to find our t value. Again, we know it's at 0 0.05, and we're dealing with 12. But remember, degree of freedom is going to equal to our sample size 12 minus 1, which equals to 11. Okay, so let's go to the chart. To the chart, to the chart, to the chart, 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 to the chart, to the chart, to the chart, chart, chart. Okay, so it's still the second column. Still one tail. We're not dealing with two tails. Probably going to deal with two tails more in chapter 11. So let's get rid of these. Since we already calculated the degree of freedom, we know that's going to be 11. Okay. So 11 in the second chart is going to end up being 1.796. Now we can actually start calculating t. But the first thing that we have to do is calculate standard uh, deviation. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate our um, standard deviation for our sample size. So again, we're going to need our Excel. So let's get Excel out. So here's our Excel. And this one I went ahead and I already had filled in some of the items that we need to do, like x minus x bar, and then we're going to have to square that. But we need to figure out our mean, variance, and standard deviation. So, since we're not figuring out mode or any of those, we don't really need those. We just need to punch in our numbers. So 51, 175, 47... 54, 145, 
Man, some of these people really do a lot of text message per day. Wow. All right. So let's go ahead and find the sum. File. Not file. Psst. Home. And we can actually do auto sum, which is right here. Auto sum ends up being 990. Okay. Now we still need to figure out the mean. So let's go and equal to the sum. Again, we had 12 divided by our sample size. So that's 82.5. That is our mean. Okay. That is our average. Next, we take that, which is x bar. We take our number, minus 82.5. Again, the reason why I do that and not select that one is that it makes it easier to drag down and calculate. There we go. Again, let's see, formulas, auto sum. By auto sum, most of the time it will end up coming out to zero if it's a normal distribution. It's a fun little thing. If it doesn't, I mean, as long as you're doing it that way, you're good. All right. Next, we need the square of these. So, equal at times itself will give us our squares. Calculate. And again, we're going to auto sum. Because we do need to know the sum for the variance. So formula, auto sum. So this is going to equal to this number divided by our sample size, 12 minus 1. Remember, since it's a sample size, does change just a tad bit when we figure out variance and standard deviation. Which is 3539364 variance. And this is going to equal to basically the square root. So let's go find the square root formula. And the number is going to be the variance. So we're looking at 59.49255, or basically about 59 and a half. Let's keep it simple, okay? So that is our standard deviation for our sample size. Now that we know this, and we also know our sample mean we can calculate t value. So might as well just go ahead and keep going right here. Um, we're going to pop up our calculator. And we know the sample size is 82.5. That's our mean. Minus the population mean, which is 67, ends up being 15.5. Okay, that's not it. Not done yet. We got to divide by our standard deviation for our sample size, which again we're going to keep simple at 59.5. Divide it by the square root of 12. We'll equal out to 0 0.902. Okay, so. Is this uh, greater than the t-value? Remember, t-value was 1.796. It is not. Okay? So we cannot reject the null. The null seems like it is correct. So through all this, we cannot reject the null. Because it is less than our t-value. Okay, 
So right now the alternative is wrong. It is not greater than 67. All right. Now using the p-value calculator, our statistical software, uh, p-value ends up being about 0.1932. Uh, that is going through um, uh, different calculations. If at the homework we have this with a t-value, I will go over it in the homework practice problem. I'm going to try and yeah, go away. Because as long as you get the basics of what we're going to be using, then we're good. Because um, again, calculating p-value, I mean, we have 1.55. I think they actually take... Let's see, how are they doing this? Because it's almost like they're going to have to find the Z. So, they use the Z. But we don't know population standard. So, they're doing a different item that we're not really doing. So, we're going to try, if that happens on the homework, we'll calculate with the homework. So let me know if that does happen with the p-value. I don't really want to get into that one for our t-values right now. Um, it's just not, not, it's not really what we're going to need for. So probability could be about 19%. So it's still not very good. But we're going to deal with that a little bit later on. So this was going to conclude uh, our lecture for Chapter 10. Um, again, the main focus that we want to know is can you understand how to create the hypothesis and can you calculate when there's a known standard deviation and an unknown standard deviation? Okay. If you have any uh, questions, make sure you email me and we'll see you next time for another exciting chapter as we keep moving on in business stats.